What I'd like you to do to start is close your eyes. Shut them tight. Shut them tight. I'm looking to see whose eyes are closed. I want you to picture people that have been most influential in your life, in your career. Not family members, but people who are not related to you by blood. And I'm gonna do a little mind reading here. You know I'm telepathic. <laughs> so I'm getting lots of images coming in from the audience about your people. And I would bet that those people are both smart and caring and compassionate and loving. Not only do they have the smarts to influence you in your academic career, but they really cared about you on a deep personal level. Am I right? Okay, you can open your eyes now. I want you to remember that because you have that effect on people too. And it's your duty and responsibility to carry that smarts and that compassion and loving and kindness forward and give it back to the people that you interact with too. Now the reason I said all that is because I want to introduce a new word to Kurt about what a teacher and a leader is. And for me, it's a lighthouse. I know you're looking at me strange. How can a person be a lighthouse? Well, I want you to picture now a lighthouse in your mind and what it does and how it's built. So a lighthouse is built on high ground that never crumbles away. It's the tallest structure around and it provides a beacon of light, but a very focused beacon. But then as it comes out of that lighthouse, it spreads everywhere. If you've seen a lighthouse, not only does the light go this way, but this way and this way all the time. And think of, oops, sorry, Tom. <laughs> I get carried away. Now you know what Tom looks like. Um, and that light provides guidance to ships, where to go, what to do, where to, where to travel, how to stay safe. Well, for me, Tom Reeves has been the lighthouse in my life. Tom is a professor emeritus at the University of Georgia. And when I was a doctoral student, Tom was my guiding light. I never thought in a million years that I would be introducing him. I know that he will be your lighthouse too. Wow, thank you, Sarah. I just, I don't know what to say really, but uh, it's mutual, absolutely mutual uh, with Sarah and uh, she's just been so amazing. I was actually in this room, uh, thanks to her and her wonderful team, four years ago. They had a conference called Education 2020. And uh, it's great to be back and to see so many different people, but some people that were here back then as well. So uh, the title, I'm blown away, thank you, Sarah. The title of this talk is uh, a Transformational Potential of Educational Design Research in Colleges of Medicine. But as soon as I looked at the title this morning, I thought, ooh, I should have just said, uh, left the last few words off, because it really, uh, EDR, as I like to call it, has transformational potential across the spectrum. And I hope that you'll come away from this little talk uh, feeling that way. Um, and so let me just get started here. So, uh, so today is uh, 
Valentine's Day, and my wife is actually out here in Houston with me. Um, I guess I need, do I need to stay here closer to the mic, or? Um, There's a handheld mic. Oh, okay. Testing. What, does this work? Well, it is. Testing. One, two, three. You hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so my wife is uh, actually out here in Houston with me. Uh, but she's uh, about an hour and a half north of here visiting her sister, but we'll be together tonight. And my wife, uh, Patricia Reeves, Tricia, is uh, just retired as a professor of social work at uh, the University of Georgia. And uh, she used to, when I first uh, met her, she was a flight attendant, believe it or not. But uh, then after we were married, she became a hospital social worker. And then years later, she decided to go back and get her PhD and eventually became a professor of social work and now is a professor emerita of social work from the University of Georgia. And we love dogs and, and uh, our, um, these particular, we've had Westies, West Highland Terrier. Anybody have a Westie? Uh, oh, uh, okay, somebody uh, raised their hand back there. That's great. So they have the highest self-esteem in the dog kingdom. Uh, they think the world revolves around them. These two, are, we've had Westies for over 30 years. These two are named Button and Zipper. So if we get another one, it'll be named Velcro. <laughs> so uh, the University of Georgia. Sarah is a graduate of the University of Georgia. That's where she got her undergraduate. Yes, go dogs, absolutely. Uh, have any of, you, any of you have degrees from the University of Georgia? Okay, well that can be remedied. Uh, <laughs> now we have a beautiful campus and I hope that you uh, come. You know, I was amazed uh, here, I see these little robots delivering food on the campus and uh, it's, I got some pictures made with these robots. That's wonderful, but we never work in Athens, would it, Sarah? Because the, our campus is very, very hilly. So I don't think the, the robots would be able to chug up and down all our hills. Uh, now, the last time I was here, I spoke about the work I do with the World Health Organization. I've been very, very privileged to work with the WHO for uh, about a decade now, and uh, I have had the opportunity to teach two week-long courses for the WHO. One is called uh, Designing Courses for Learning. So it's basically uh, most of the people who come to these uh, courses uh, are um, from uh, emerging economies, uh, and they uh, are physicians and pharmacists and public health inspectors and other professionals in the health sciences, and suddenly they've been put in a role where they've got to teach or train and so forth, and they don't really know anything about course design or about teaching. So one course is designing courses for learning, and the other one's called learning facilitation skills. It's basically a course on how to teach, and I really love doing this kind of work. You see the learners here, there's folks there from uh, Brazil and Indonesia and Iran and Egypt and uh, Chile and uh, uh, Thailand and uh, Turkey and all over the place. So it's wonderful experiences. Uh, and and uh, we have a lot of fun in these courses and so forth. So I, uh, we're gonna have some fun this afternoon. Kurt mentioned uh, We'll be doing these breakout sessions later today. And the one that I'm going to do will be in this room, and we're going to introduce you uh, to 25 different ways to teach. It's going to be a game kind of type of thing. And I'll be doing the same thing twice. So you can either come to the first one or the second one. We'll, we'll limit it to uh, about 40 folks at a time because we uh, of the number of game pieces we have, frankly. But uh, we'll have some fun with that, hopefully. It's a card game. It looks like cards. Yep, 25 different uh, learning activities, ways of supporting learning. I like cards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, I retired in 2010, but I, I still uh, am a professor emeritus, and I'm still very involved. I have an office on campus, and I'm mainly involved in fundraising. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of need in, in higher education today. We have, uh, I've found out har shocking things, uh, students who are food insecure, students who literally are living in their cars sometimes, uh, and uh, you wouldn't think that, in this, uh, but it's, it's true. 
Uh, but I've also gotten, since I've retired, I've been able to do a lot more international work. I, I went to uh, India a few years ago in, uh, as a volunteer and taught uh, workshops for uh, teachers who uh, developed teaching materials for 70,000 teachers in indigenous uh, areas of India. So I got to visit some of the schools and so forth. Love doing that sort of thing. So how many of you here are uh, physicians or uh, nurse practitioners or other types of medical practitioners? Okay, <coughs> wonderful, wonderful. A lot of hands go up. So you know, in your profession, you are very systematic about what you do. You, uh, you know, you, when you meet a new patient, you get a history. Uh, you do an examination, you get various tests done and so forth, and you don't make decisions casually. It's a very important process, and that a big part of your learning is learning how to do that uh, you know, engagement and so forth. But it's interesting, I've found that, and I, I used to teach at the Medical University of South Carolina, and. Uh, all too often, those of us who have teaching and training responsibilities in health science, education, and medical education, we don't apply any kind of systematic process to teaching. We just think, oh, we gotta teach a course. Well, we'll have some lectures, we'll have a textbook, we'll, do, we'll have some uh, tests, and so forth. We're very, very traditional, because that's frankly, the way many of us learned. I remember uh, in 1981, when I started at the Medical University of South Carolina, I met with a, a professor, very distinguished professor, and I'm this brand new PhD from Syracuse University, and I said, uh, well, sir, I, I, we're gonna help you design a better course, and I said, first thing I wanna know is what are your learning objectives? And he said, well, son, I didn't have learning objectives when I went to medical school, and I'm not gonna have met learning objectives now. So that was my first week, <laughs> so far. <laughs> We've gotten a little bit farther, uh, further now, but uh, we don't apply the wonderful things that we know in medicine to education. Um, medical science has just made such amazing advances. Kurt showed some robots, maybe we'll be assisting you in the near future. Time Magazine apparently thinks that's going to happen as well. But, I mean, think about it. I read these statistics recently in a, a column by, uh, I think it was uh, Atul Gawande, 70 percent decline in the U.S. death rate from cardiovas cardiovascular disease over the past 50 years. That's an amazing difference drop of more than 1% annually in the cancer death rate over the past 20 years. In the life expectancy, Kurt mentioned this as well, life expectancy for a baby born in the U.S. has risen from 47 years in 1900 to more than 78 years today. You know, amazing, amazing progress. Now there's still lots of areas where there's need and, and we need to make more progress and so forth. But you know, if you're in the medical profession, you can't help but take great pride in the advances that have been made. And so this child has a much brighter future health-wise in many, many uh, ways. What about education? Golly gee. You know, whenever Time Magazine has a uh, cover about education, it's usually something like this, rotten apples. It's nearly impossible to fire a bad teacher. Uh, and what do we find? I remember when I first came to the University of Georgia in 1982, there was a report published called A Nation at Risk about the deplorable situation in, in K-12 education. The nation is still at risk, uh, and it may even be worse. And they've tried everything since then, all these various plans, standardized testing, punitive accountability, school choice, they have all utterly failed. Today, 
You know, we hear about, you know, oh, everybody's employed, everybody has jobs, the economy's never been better, the stock market's off the chart. Nearly half of U.S. students qualify for free or reduced price lunches. Half of our children are still living in poverty. Federal and state investments in higher education are dropping at an amazing rate. At the University of Georgia, we used to get nearly 50% of our funding from the state, now it's around 20%. I'm sure every one of you connected with the university knows that this is happening. In some states, uh, the uh, state funding for higher education is in the single digits. And meanwhile, our futures as academics is still driven by this really false, strange game called publish or perish. Um, and we've lost the balance, I think. Rigor is what is emphasized. Relevance, impact, really making a difference. That has been lost along the way. Part of it is because so many of the people in power who write the textbooks for educational research are in love with RCTs. They think randomized controlled trials, if we could just do that in education, that would be the way to make the same advances we've seen in medicine and education. And so Robert Slavin at John Hopkins University has written several very popular textbooks on educational research, and he says there's only five questions you need to ask about educational, a re educational research study. Is there a control group? Are the control and experimental groups assigned randomly? RCTs, the gold standard. If a match study, are the groups extremely similar? Is the sample size large enough? And are the results statistically significant? That's one model. I like Charles DeForges, a professor who's also written educational research books in the UK. And he says that the status of research deemed educational would have to be judged first in terms of its discipline, quality, and secondly in terms of its impact. Poor discipline is no discipline, and we can all agree on that. If we do research, it should be discipline. But RCTs is not the only way to do research. And then he went on to say, an excellent research without impact is not educational. And all, I've, I fear that so much of what we've done in educational research just doesn't have impact. We sometimes throw our research over the walls of classrooms, but it doesn't really have, it doesn't stick, it doesn't make an impact. My field of educational technology is one of the worst. We have a history of no significant differences. You can go all the way back to the 1920s when Thomas Edison predicted that the films the, for his film projector would replace textbooks within 10 years and that films were going to be much more effective than textbooks on learning. And we promised that kind of thing every time a new technology comes. And people are making the same predictions today for virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printers, et cetera, et cetera. They're all gonna revolutionize education. I used to be the editor of one of these journals. These, I've published in a lot of these journals, so is uh, Sarah and Kurt and other, Susie and other folks in this room. But our journals, unfortunately, are full of studies that are no significant differences. Again and again, we try this RCT, or more likely a quasi-experimental study, and we find no significant differences. There's even a book out there called The No Significant Differences Phenomenon. <laughs> now, I've been involved in learning research since 1966. That's me in the middle of that photo, and I'm putting a rat in a three-stage rocket. <laughs> and it was a, a, an experiment on learning. The study was called The Effects of Sudden Acceleration and Deceleration on Rat Memory. 
<laughs> Sounds pretty sophisticated for a high school senior. Okay, so my buddies and I, and by the way, this is an interesting picture. This was in the local newspaper in LaGrange, Georgia. And the boys who were doing the rat rocket work with me are the boys with glasses on. There are four boys there with glasses on. All the other boys were just, they wanted to get in the picture. Some of them were athletes and uh, they just wanted to get in the picture. The boy, Charlie Farmer, who was one of my closest friends, a tall boy holding the rocket. He was the star basketball player at the school. But we did uh, an experimental design. We had two rats, Julia and Susan, uh, named after the two uh, cheerleaders that we all pined after. <laughs> And we trained them both to run a maze. And uh, they both were really good at running the maze. We blasted Julia off into space in a three-stage rocket. She floated back down safe. And then we put her in the maze. And guess what we found? No significant differences. <laughs> You know, in truth, the study should have been called the effects of rat compression on rat memory because it turned out we bought the rats too early. And we built our, we had our plans for our rocket and the rat grew. We hadn't really, you know, thought of that variable. The rat's going to grow. And so the day of the launch, we were literally carving out more space in the nose cone to, to fit this poor little rat in there. I don't think we'd get uh, approval to do this study today. So I've been uh, studying learning since 1966. Now in medical education, frankly, there's also a fantasy that RCTs are the way to uh, do research uh, in health science education. Uh, and others have remarked on this. This is uh, Glenn, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Glenn. Uh, is uh, center of, from the Center for Health Education Scholarship at Faculty of Medicine at uh, University of British Columbia. And he's written that health professional, the health professional education community has, has become deeply entrenched in the notion of the physical sciences as presenting a model for the ideal research. Again, it's uh, this marriage with RCTs. And so I, I haven't had a time to do a comprehensive review, uh, but as I've looked at the journals, and there is a proliferation of them, uh, journals some of you may know, medical education, academic medicine, uh, clinical teacher, teacher, medical teacher, et cetera, et cetera, specialties like anatomical sciences education. Again, you see this overwhelming preference for experimental designs, and you show no significant differences problem persist. Just recently, I, I've seen several reviews of, you know, the cutting edge uh, approaches to teaching, and, and yet when they're subjected to RCTs, they don't, they, they seem not to work. But we know they work in many cases, so it's really strange. I think we need to shift from randomized controlled trials that's trying to prove what works to educational design research that tries to figure out how can we make this work. That's really the big difference uh, that we're looking for. So let me tell you more about that. Oh, by the way, we also do too much research on things. Whatever the latest thing is, VR, iPads, serious games, unserious games, digital cadavers, whatever it is, we're gonna run the same studies that we've been running for 60 years some kind of quasi-experimental study, uh, and it's probably going to come up with no significant differences. We don't do enough research on problems. What are the problems in health science education? In effective teaching, lack of intellectual curiosity, inadequate higher order learning, motivation is, is poor, failure to engage our learners, failure to encourage their intellectual curiosity. I went to the University of Virginia in November to speak to their medical school about this, and they told me that only 30% of their students come to lectures now. Most of the students prefer 
to watch the videos and, and just you know, fast forward and all that kind of stuff. And so they're trying to figure out a way to increase attendance at lectures. Think about that. Is that really what we want to do? I'm not so sure. But insufficient time on task. Learning really boils down to a very simple thing. It's time on task. You ha learning is not easy. Learning is not effortless. Learning takes time and effort. And anything we can do to increase time on task is really going to change things. So uh, this is the second edition of a book I wrote with a dear colleague from the University of Twente in the Netherlands, Susan McKinney. Susan, uh, I've known her since she's a graduate student. And uh, a few years ago, her <clears throat> she and her husband and their three little boys came to Athens for her sabbatical. Her husband's a physician. And uh, they, uh, we ended up uh, teaching a course on design-based research together. And uh, is that why the lights are fading on and off? Okay. <laughs> Thought maybe I was going to faint or something. <laughs> okay. We have to, I think, shut them down for a moment. Okay. 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 Sorry to pause you there. No, that's okay. So, um, um, thank you. <laughs> So uh, Susan and I have worked together for 20 years now, and uh, we're, uh, uh, we just uh, submitted a paper uh, to the journal uh, Medical Education uh, on um, how educational design research can be an approach to overcome uh, some problems in that area. So hopefully that will be accepted. Uh, stay tuned. So what is this thing called educational design research? Some people call it design-based research. Some people call it just design research or development research, et cetera. It goes by many, many names. But we like the term educational design research. More, uh, that's more of a European approach. In the States, it tends to be called design-based research. First and foremost, it starts with the focus on a problem. What is the challenge? What is the problem? Maybe it could be improving medical students' clinical reasoning skills. And then it also features close collaboration with practitioners. You're not the scientist in the white lab coat rot watching the rats run around in a maze. You're actually working hand in hand with the people that own the problem because they're the ones that can help you understand what the problem really is. Then you create a, based on a review of the literature and review of the uh, design principles, you create a prototype learning environment informed by theory and practice. You emphasize content and pedagogy rather than technology alone. Technology may have a role. All the exciting technologies that Kurt showed us are marvelous, so exciting. But if you don't change the pedagogy, if you don't change the way people learn with those things, then why would there be any difference? I remember years ago uh, when LaserDisc, how many of you remember LaserDisc, video disc, huge platters? The Army bought into those big time, and they, they had all these print uh, materials that they'd used for years for what they called skills qualification test, where soldiers could take these courses and, and get a higher rank. And they said, well, we're going to put all those on LaserDisc. And they wanted to do a randomized control trial. We'll give 50,000 soldiers the print-based <laughs> materials, and we'll give 50,000 soldiers the LaserDisc. What do you think they found? No significant differences. <laughs> they didn't change the pedagogy. It was the same thing. They just put it on a different technology, and that's unfortunately what we all too often do. You need to give special attention to supporting human interactions, and then you go through multiple iterations of testing re and refining and retesting the learning environment until the learning outcome is reached. It may take months, it may take years, but you're iteratively testing and refining your treatment over time. And at the same time, you're also refining theory. 
you, two major goals of educational design research, to develop an intervention that's going to be um, a more effective teaching and learning environment, and at the same time to refine learning theory, and then the result is often what you call design principles, principles that could be applied in other contexts to other innovations. Educational design research is not a specific methodology. It's not defined by its methods, but by its goals. It's more of a genre of research, a genre of inquiry. So the, it yields two things, though, a robust program, product, or policy, and usable knowledge, usable theory, such as design principles. So we have a model. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this right now because I want to show how it might be applied. But there's basically uh, ma three major phases. You start off analysis and exploration in close collaboration with practitioners so that you really understand the nature of the problem. Why aren't your students developing better clinical reasoning skills? Why aren't they intellectually curious? Why aren't they committed to lifelong learning? Whatever that problem is, you really want to understand that. Then you go through a phase of design and construction of a prototype intervention. And what this model doesn't do a good job of representing is in the next phase you go through multiple iterations of evaluation and reflection. And your overall goal is to have a mature intervention and to have enhanced theoretical understanding. You're also paying attention to implementation and spread. How could we share this with others? How could others learn from our experience? So what does this look like? So this was a uh, study published in uh, EDUCAUSE Review, uh, and uh, it was a do doctoral dissertation done by a woman named uh, Nicoletti, and uh, her dissertation was called Paper or Tablet, Reading, Recall, and Comprehension. So what did this study consist of? She actually was on the staff at the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Leadership Academy, and most of the people that would go to this academy were non-commissioned officers who were learning to be better leaders. And this Coast Guard Academy decided, let's get rid of print books and let's give everybody a tablet device and put all their readings on the tablet device. So she wanted to examine whether or not people read, learn more from reading on a tablet or reading on paper. So here's her study. It was done at the University of Connecticut. She had, because uh, it's a military context, you can do RCTs. She had 231 students randomly assigned to either a digital tablet version of a paper or a paper version. The treatment was an 800-word leadership article. The treatment time was less than 10 minutes. And then she had outcome measures, uh, 10 multiple choice questions to measure recall accuracy and two short essay questions to measure comprehension. This is the RCT that Slavin and others say we ought to do, right? What do you think she found? No significant differences. <laughs> and yet it gets published in this really uh, uh, widely read journal and they gave her a PhD. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. But why do we keep doing research like this? So how would we do it differently if we were going to do educational design research? Let's look at this. First thing I'd want to know is what's the problem? Why aren't people, uh, you know, why, it, why does it matter whether, you, you know, you, tablet or uh, paper? What's the real problem? Maybe it's that people aren't even doing the readings. Has that ever happened in your courses? <laughs> Um, by the way, that 800-word essay wasn't even part of the course that they were in. It was just something that she put together differently. Um, so then you'd go through a uh, 
phase of analysis and exploration, really trying to figure out what is the problem at the Coast Guard Academy that this uh, having tablets or paper were, would be involved with. Maybe it would be a problem of course alignment. Anytime you have a learning environment, anytime you have a course, there are seven factors that have to be carefully aligned. Your learning objectives, your content, your instructional design, your learner tasks, your faculty roles, your technology roles, and your assessment. Now, I've set up some simple dichotomies here, but in learning objectives, you can have lower order, discrete objectives, and those can be really important. I had to have a blood draw uh, on Monday, and uh, I had, they had a, a student there learning, and they asked if she could practice on me, and I'm the kind of guy that says yes to those things. <laughs> Well, I'm also the kind of guy that takes Waffer and Coumadin. And she stuck me so many times. And there was blood going everywhere. And she left the room crying. <laughs> so somewhere, you know, maybe she needed some simulators or something earlier <laughs> than when she actually got to me. Um, or you could hi have higher order robust mental models. What's the mental model of disease progression um, and so forth? Content could be some areas of, of health science education. There is one right answer and people need to know it. But in other areas, there's multiple perspectives. Just look at what's going on with the coronavirus. We don't really know. And, and there are lots of different insights coming in the way. Uh, by the way, I saw a headline this morning uh, that the world is, uh, uh, of e-learning folks are trying to develop in a rush e-learning to uh, provide to students who are trapped by the coronavirus, who can't now go to school. Um, instructional design. Lectures are good for some things, but experiential learning, authentic tasks, and so forth. What are the tasks that the learner is going to do? Are they going to write a paper about something? Or are they going to do something more authentic? The role of the faculty member, is it, is it to be a didactic instructor or is it be, to be more of a mentor or facilitator? The role of the technology, is it to provide video lectures or tutorials or is it more to do realistic simulations, communications, those types of things? And then finally, the role of the assessment. Is it, are you testing for discrete knowledge? Or are you trying to get, tap into what are their mental models? What do they really understand here? And so these things have to be aligned. If you've got, you know, maybe in the case of the Coast Guard Academy, those readings aren't, you know, people quickly understand, hey, those readings aren't aligned with the test that we're gonna take. The tests are all coming from some other thing, lectures or whatever, and so, I'm not gonna do the readings. Maybe there's an alignment problem. So alignment could have been the issue. We don't know. Second thing though, we wanna develop a prototype solution to the problem, whatever that problem ends up being. So we go through a phase of design and construction. Uh, we already know, we should have known that it doesn't matter whether you're gonna read on paper or read on tablet. Well, maybe it does, actually. The most recent research shows that people who read from print learn more than they read from tablets. There is research now showing that. But, uh, but what, imagine instead that this was a, um, a, a course they were learning about alien migrant interdiction at sea, something the Coast Guard is involved in. And so they had, maybe there would be some sort of interactive simulation. Then the device, the iPad, could be very useful because you'd have some sort of interactive simulation. I've just got a simple idea here, but stop the video when policy is violated. But you could have a real, uh, some of the things that Kurt showed us, you know, really high fidelity interactive simulations to deal with these kinds of issues that they have to deal with when they're uh, helping uh, migrants at sea. Then you'd go through iterative stages of testing and refinement with your prototype 
until you found that the problem was alleviated. And ideally, in the end, you'd have a mature intervention. You'd have a real need and use for the iPads or whatever device they had, but you'd also have new theoretical understanding. So that's how I would have advised that student to do a dissertation. Um, educational design research has impact on real world problems. That's what it's all about, having impact. What about medical education? Any challenges that you're facing? Or health science education more generally? I think there are some challenges out there. How do we uh, help our learners to learn to communicate in a culturally competent manner with patients? That's going to be so important here with the new medical school at the University of Houston because as I've read the materials, you are preparing physicians to work in with disadvantaged populations, either in the inner city or rural areas. So how do you communicate? with culturally competent manner with your patients. Work effectively in increasingly fluid healthcare teams. Engage in expert clinical reasoning. Follow infection control protocols 100% of the time. I'm gonna be going into the hospital next month for a procedure. Uh, I can't even pronounce it, Lip, lipotripsy, what is it? Is that what it's called? If my insurance approves it. <laughs> um, so um, I will hope that people are following the infection control protocols 100% of the time there. Uh, so how could we do design research in this area? Well, let's think about hand washing. A few years ago, I read a book by Atul Gawande called Better. And in Better, he talks about this, was, uh, this book's been out for a long time, but he the first chapter was all about hand washing. And there's good news and bad news. Healthcare asso associated infections have plummeted over the last 15 years with better education and better technology. Back in those days, he cited a study, I think, that they did in Australia where they asked physicians how often they clean their hands between going from one patient to another. And the physicians said they did it 92% of the time. Then they had nurses track the physicians. It was under 15%. Pretty, talk about significant differences. But the bad news is still today, and this is from the BMJ 2019, one in 20 patients are affected by preventable harm at a cost of, in the U.S. alone, just in the U.S., $9 billion a year. So it's still a big problem. So if, let's say we want to have our medical students and other practitioners really follow these protocols for uh, disinfection and so forth, antisepsis. So what's the problem? It's the first thing we'd want to know. And so we'd go through uh, an initial orientation to the problem, do literature review, do field-based investigations. I mean, there's amazing, uh, according to Atul Gawande, there's amazing differences in the rates of infection in different hospitals around the world. And so uh, go out to where they're really successful and find out what are they doing there. You, you do site visits, professional meetings, networking, et cetera. So it's just kind of breaking out that phase, phase, first phase a little bit. Oh, this is the book I mentioned, Better. Um, and things have gotten better, but they still have a ways to go. By the way, I've read every one of Atul Gawande's books. I think they ought to be on the syllabus of every course in health science. Uh, they're amazing. Um, now, but part of the problem with following protocols like the hand uh, washing is we forgot a whole learning domain. There are three traditional learning domains, the cognitive, the affective, and the psychomotor. You've all heard about these, I'm sure. So we have different uh, 
uh, hierarchies for these different domains. And the cognitive domain uh, you know, goes from remembering up to creating. Unfortunately, all too often in health science education, we say we value the higher end, creating, evaluating, analyzing, but when we look at what we do in our learning environments, our coursework, we teach and test at the lower levels of the pyramid. The affective domain has its own hierarchy, so does the psychomotor domain. These are all important, particularly in medical practice. Every one of these things is important. You have to have the knowledge, you have to have the values and the caring and the passion. You have to have the skills. But we forgot a whole learning domain. Kurt mentioned I was probably gonna talk about this. The conative domain. Conation. How many of you have heard the word conative before? Conative. When you type it into Word, Satid's heard it. <laughs> when you type it into Word, it'll try to correct it to cognitive. It's a hard word to get into a document. What is it all about? It's about will, desire, level of effort, drive, striving, mental energy, self-determination, intention. Turns out it's been around for thousands of years. Aristotle talked about the cognitive learning domain. He said to be a successful charioteer, you had to have a driver of the chariot, the cognitive domain, but you needed two powerful steeds, two powerful horses, the affective, the passion, and the cognitive, the follow through, the drive, the commitment to doing it right. Needed both of those things. In the 1880s, German psychologists were studying this and they said there are three important mental states involved in learning, the cognitive, the affective, and the cognitive. And then what happened to it? It disappeared for decades because of those damn behaviorists. Okay. Now if you go into Amazon and you look for books with the word cognitive in the title, there's only a handful, very few. But one of the ones that I've uh, learned from is by Kathy Kobe, and she does a great example of explaining the difference between the cognitive, the affective, and the cognitive. It's the difference between knowing, feeling, and acting. I saw a story in the Chicago Times, Chicago uh, newspaper recently, about a group of workers in Wisconsin who were gonna be replaced by um, robots. Uh, so these were assembly line workers. And the rationale the company had for replacing them was that they couldn't keep up with the healthcare cost of the humans. And you, they had a picture in the paper of the humans on break, and the humans are all smoking, and most of them are overweight. And according to the article, a lot of them were using opioids and so forth and weren't reliable workers. And so they said, we have to replace them with robots because robots don't smoke, robots don't have health care costs, robots uh, don't sh not show up for work. So it's a different, you know, most people who smoke, they know, they have the knowledge, they know it's bad for them, and maybe they feel they really want to do it, but they just don't act. They just don't, you know, and we all have aspects of our life like that. I am obviously someone that could lose some weight, and so, yeah, I know when I go to a restaurant, my wife says, you really want a steak? The fish looks good. The salad looks lovely, you know. Now, when I'm with her, I do the right thing. <laughs> it's the difference between thinking, feeling, and willing thought, emotion, and volition, epistemology, aesthetics, and ethics, knowing, caring, and doing. We have not emphasized this enough in our health sciences education. We've really got to deal with the cognitive domain. This will be the difference between those people who follow the protocols for hand washing and those who don't. We've got to pay attention to the cognitive domain <clears throat> in our learning environments. So then we go through a phase of uh, examining the state of the art of interventions, and this 
type of uh, area and uh, develop a prototype. And there's, you know, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to uh, uh, deal with this too much here. But, you know, what are the best design ideas that are out there? Uh, in terms of cognitive knowledge, psychomotor skills, affective commitment, and cognitive habits. How can the solution be improved? Then we go through iterations until we got it. Now, I'm on the advisory board for a new medical school that's being established in the UK, but it's going to be a worldwide school. And I was going to link out and show you this a little bit, but I'll, the slides will be available for you. And I, advise, I really recommend that you take a look at IMED Trust. And this hospital, or this medical school, like the new one here at the University of Houston, is going to be focused on preparing uh, family practitioners who are going to work in developing countries. So why isn't design re educational design research conducted more widely? We again can turn to Atul Gawande. He wrote an article in the New Yorker called Fast Ideas and Slow Ideas. He talked about anesthesiology. In 1846, it was developed at, uh, in, Ma in Boston by w William T.G. Morton. And fascinating, within months, everybody in the U.S was using anesthesiology. Within two years, anesthesiology was being used around the world. Before this, of course, they had to do surgery really fast, and the patient was kicking and screaming. You had to have uh, professionals holding the person down. Hopefully, they passed out. Uh, and so anesthesiology was an innovation that swept the world in incredibly rapid time. In 1865, Joseph Lister in Glasgow, Scotland, came up with a strategy for antisepsis using carbolic acid. A little boy had been run over by a cart. He had a compound fracture. That was a death sentence in those days. And so he poured carbolic acid, painful obviously, but it killed the germs. He had been studying the work of Louis Pasteur and believed in germ theory at the time most physicians didn't believe in germs. They, didn't, they thought that was a myth. And so it took decades for antisepsis to take off. In 1881, James Garfield, president of the United States, was shot in the back with a small bullet. It was a superficial wound, would have survived, but his physicians put their unclean fingers in the wound trying to draw the, the bullet out and it introduced sepsis. He took months to die, but it was the sepsis that killed him, not the bullet. So why did anesthesiology take off like a rocket and antisepsis is still a problem today? Well, anesthesia shows an immediate effect on a very visible problem. You've got a kicking and screaming patient. It benefited both the patients and the physicians and it's relatively easy. Yeah, we've got a whole new profession called anesthesiologists, but it's relatively easy. Antisepsis, on the other hand, showed no immediate effect on an invisible problem. It benefited patients, but it inconvenienced physicians. It's hard. Anesthesia benefits patients and physicians. It's easy. Antisepsis benefits patients but it's hard for physicians. Experimental RCTs benefit researchers, not practitioners, and it's easy. Educational design research benefits practitioners, but it's hard for researchers. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Richard Mayer is the most prolific person in our field. He is a professor and he's a friend of mine. Rich has uh, 145,000 citations in Google Scholar as of the other day. Uh, amazing. But what does Rich do? Rich does experimental studies. Usually his treatments are under 20 minutes long. They're quick and controlled studies. They yield publishable findings rapidly. They're done alone or with students, one student. He, his participants are subjects, usually undergraduates at his university. And frankly, it's easy. By contrast, Professor Sasha Barab at Arizona State 
has a mere 22,495 citations as of the other day. Uh, but he does educational design research. It's long-term and messy. It's more difficult to publish. It requires a team. You don't have subjects, you have collaborators. It's hard. I don't want you to go away from here thinking this is easy. It is hard. So what are you gonna do? I think that educational design research enables a balance between relevance and rigor that's socially responsible. I've been calling for socially responsible educational technology research since the 80s. And this is what I think we need to do. I'm obviously biased. And, so don't waste your life. <laughs> do educational design research. Thank you very much.